Hello my dear children. Welcome back to Byju's. This is Neha Sharma and you all know already that we are in the process of discussion of NEET 2019 paper biology section. I hope you all are following the concepts. I hope you all are following the way how we need to really look at the questions when we are solving the paper. So without any further ado, let us start the session. Let's see this question. Which of the following is a commercial blood cholesterol lowering agent? Okay, so we are talking about the blood cholesterol lowering agent. Out of the given molecules, uh, or rather I should say options, first is lipase. What are lipases? Lipases are basically the enzymes which are responsible for breakdown of fat into fatty acids and glycerol. This is basically produced by the pancreas, by mouth, right? Then we go on to cyclosporin A. What is cyclosporin A? It's basically an immunosuppressant, immunosuppressant or immunosuppressing agent, right? So immunosuppressant, right? Uh, what is this used for? It's basically used for preventing the rejection that happens usually post allogenic organ transplant, right? So this is an immune uh, system kind of suppressing agent. It's a very important point here. Uh, this is basically a non-ribosomal peptide for that matter. I'll come to the discussion part just in a while after, you know, uh, breaking the answer to you. Then comes the statins. Statin is exactly what is the right answer. Statins are basically uh, those molecules which kind of bind competitively to an enzyme which is called as HMG-CoA reductase. What is HMG-CoA reductase? It stands for hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A which is a very important enzyme for synthesis of cholesterol because Statins block this particular enzyme. That is why cholesterol synthesis reduces and that is why it brings about the lowering of the cholesterol, right? Very conceptual topic, very conceptual way of understanding this particular option rather than just trying to mug up things, right? So the right answer we have got. Let's still talk about streptokinase, which is option D. What is streptokinase? Streptokinase is basically once again an enzyme which basically dissolves the clot right it has fibron uh, fibrinolytic activity what is fibrinolytic activity that basically refers to uh, some enzymes which basically have the capacity to break down the clots all right clear everyone yes so this is all about the options and you have definitely understood the right answer so let me take you through the whole concept related to this particular question first thing we talk about the right answer that is statins what are statins they are basically components which block the enzyme called as hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme a like i already told you in the liver that is responsible for making cholesterol it's a very important point all right so like you see in this image already very clearly HMG-CoA. What is HMG-CoA like I specified? Hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A. Okay. Now this molecule uh, basically forms something called as mevalonic acid which ultimately leads to synthesis of cholesterol and all this is happening in the liver. Now this is mediated by a very important enzyme which is called as HMG-CoA reductase. Now what statins do is that they competitively block the activity of this particular enzyme and thereby the cholesterol synthesis is going to be blocked and that is why people who are suffering from very high level of cholesterol or you know for any other medical reason for that matter these statins are going to bring about lowering of the blood cholesterol clear everyone yes we go on to the incorrect options now First is lipase, like I told you, they basically catalyze the hydrolysis or breakdown of fats into fatty acids and the glycerol. How does this happen? What are the major fats? Major fats are all triglycerides in nature. So, you know, you slowly bring about the removal of each and individual fatty acid from there, making it diglyceride first, following, uh, followed with making of monoglyceride and ultimately all the fatty acids are going to be released along with the release of glycerol molecules. Then we go on to the next incorrect option, which is called as cyclosporin A. What is cyclosporin A? Cyclosporin A, like I told you, it's a non-ribosomal peptide. Basically, these are not dependent on the cellular and the ribosomal uh, machinery for protein synthesis, right? So this is cyclic non-ribosomal peptide, which is, you know, about 11 amino acids long. And the most important point about it is that it's an immunosuppressant drug. It basically... Uh, 
is given to people who have undergone organ transplantation right so those people because their body doesn't want to reject that organ that has been transplant transplanted to them they don't want to uh, their body wants to kind of accept that organ as a self in order to do that the immune system of that individual has to be lowered a little bit and for that this cyclosporin a is what is used it's not a blood cholesterol lowering agent it's an immunosuppressant drug right then we go on to the third thing that was given incorrect option again but let us talk about what is streptokinase it's basically produced by because it is produced by some streptococci we have given it the name of streptokinase it's an enzyme which has thrombolytic activity or fibrinolytic activity like i already said this is involved in the breaking down of the blood clot okay breaking down of blood clot very important point so what happens here is that this basically combines with plasminogen what is plasminogen it's a very important component to get converted into plasmin first and this plasmin is what is having the activity that is required to break down the clots to dissolve the clots right so this plasmin ultimately uh, converts or rather i should say dissolves the fibrin clot and uh, you know ultimately fibrin degradation products are going to be formed but more important point is that this is going to uh, break down the clots that have formed now how is it significant and why is it significant simply because you talk about uh, patients who have deep vein thrombosis patients who have a uh, tendency to form you know pulmonary embolism etc so for those individual people who are susceptible to heart attack due to blood clots etc so pe those people can be uh, treated with streptokinase enzyme you know medically in order to dissolve these kind of blood clots and hence prevent any kind of further damage to the system okay clear everyone so the right answer for this question is going to be option c statins let's have a look at this question select the incorrect statement okay we are looking at the incorrect statement here so first statement says human males have one of the sex chromosome much shorter than the other one so we know the genotype of uh, or rather when we talk about the sex chromosome how what kind of sex chromosomes do human males have they have xy type of chromosome and the y chromosome is actually much shorter than the x chromosome that is why statement 1 is correct statement a is correct and that can't be the right answer okay looking at option b male fruit fly is heterogametic yes very much because male fruit fly have the genotype or rather the sex chrom chromosome combination as xy and hence it is going to produce the gametes one of them you know can have the x chromosome and the other one will have uh, chromosome y and that is why it is producing different types of gametes calling it as heterogametic okay so this statement is also correct let's look at the c option in male grasshoppers 50 percent of the sperms have no sex chromosome so let me remind you grasshoppers have exo type of sex determination where the females are of xx type and the males are of exo type o represents kind of zero or lack of chromosome here the other set of chromosome so basically what will happen when this kind of male undergoes meiosis and tries to produce the gametes here what will happen one of the cells will have 50 percent of the cells will have x chromosome and 50 percent will have no chromosome right i'm just making a zero here so that you understand it better that is why this statement 50 percent of the sperms has uh, no sex chromosome is a correct statement hence this also can't be the right answer so obviously the option four probably should be the right answer here let's look at it in domesticated fowls sex of progeny depends on the type of sperm rather than egg okay now domesticated fowls are basically birds and we all know that in case of birds females are heterogametic and males are homogametic so actually it should depend upon the type of egg rather than the sperm okay and that is where the statement becomes incorrect and making this option as the right answer for this particular question because we were looking at the incorrect statement okay so let us put everything together and understand the concepts related to this question so whenever you talk about sex determination we all know that it happens because of specific sex chromosomes and based on the presence of the types of sex chromosomes we call the individuals as either heterogametic or homogametic 
as the name suggests what will be heterogametic hetero means more than one gametic refers to gametes so what will be heterogametics these are the individuals which are producing different types of gametes right so two different gametes are going to be produced by the heterogametic individual and when you talk about homogametes or homogametic individual obviously homogametes are going to be produced which means what that it is going to produce similar type of gametes so only one type of gamete is going to be produced here okay uh, the best way to understand this is that in case of humans the males are heterogametic and in case of humans the females are homogametic i am giving you humans example because it is the most simplest for us to understand it right now because i think this is one of the basic sciences that uh, at this level we understand it already right so we know that males are xy type that means it's going to produce the gametes of having you know x chromosome and the y chromosome whereas when you talk about females it's going to produce whatever number of gametes it is producing it's only going to have the x chromosome clear everyone yes now let us go on to the birds okay so when you look at the birds it shows female heterogamity which means what that the female produces z and w type of gametes that is why you know i said the statement 4 is the incorrect one because it's it doesn't depend upon the sperms it de depends upon the egg all right and when you look at the males here the male domestic fowl is of zz type making the sperm uh, that is going to be produced from this the gametes that's going to be produced from this of only z type okay and from here you obviously understand it's going to be of z type and the w type so the sex determination in case of birds is going to be dependent upon the females the eggs that are produced clear yes let me take you to the other example also where you know you see a uh, male kind of heterogamity right male heterogamity in case of humans i have already told you so uh, let's go on to the drosophila the fruit fly here the male produces x and y type of gamete because the sex determine basically their chromosomal combination is of x y type and when you talk about females it only produces x type of gametes right so females show homogamity and the males show heterogamity in case of fruit flies or drosophila then further there was you know the other options also which i already told you about the y chromosome of human male is much shorter than the x chromosome and you can very clearly have a look at it right then we had grasshopper so i already told you it shows basically xo type of sex determination where the males have only one sex chromosome that is x chromosome and females have two x chromosome two x x chromosomes basically so this is a female and this one is a male grasshopper clear everyone for all these reasons the right answer to this question is going to be option d let's see this question tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume of an athlete is 500 ml and 1000 ml respectively what will be his expiratory capacity if the residual volume is 1200 ml okay now this is kind of a very straightforward question it's a question from your chapter breathing and exchange of gases where you have learned all about inspiration and expiration and all different types of volumes have been taught in that uh, chapter the capacities those are very very important topic from exam point of view okay so coming to this question what concepts are used here first thing is tidal volume okay what is tidal volume it is basically that volume of air that is usually in one respiratory cycle it's going to be either inhaled inhaled or exhaled okay now this volume usually ranges from about 300 to 500 ml but in this question we have been given the data about uh, an athlete which means it's going to be good volumes and hence the value of tidal volume has been given as 500 ml here okay looking at the second value what have we we been given expiratory reserve volume what is expiratory reserve volume so over in uh, so once a normal exhalation happens the amount of air that can be forcibly exhaled or you know expired that volume of air is what is called as the expiratory reserve volume and the value of this usually ranges from 700 to 1200 ml yes but for this question we will be taking the value of 1000 ml which is what is given in this question okay what will be his expiratory capacity 
capacity is something like a total strength right so expiratory capacity is the capacity to exhale out how much amount of volume of air is going to be exhaled out is what is referred to as the expiratory capacity so pretty obvious what do you think numerically it will be this is going to be a sum of the tidal volume which i told you already that it's basically normal inspiration or normal expiration amount of volume so here we are taking it uh, taking the expiration value or the exhalation value of it which is tidal volume and you are going to add on the forcible expiration right because the question is asking what will be the expiratory capacity which means what how much amount of air a, a person can actually forcibly uh, exhale out over and above the normal exhalation value as well so you're going to combine them both right and that is why you are going to use erv also here so for this question the answer would be very straightforward 500 ml plus 1000 ml will give you obviously 1500 ml which is what is given here as option b now if you look at the question there is also given as residual volume what is residual volume it is basically the amount or rather the volume of air that is remaining in the lungs okay now but for this particular question this volume is not relevant here and many children feel confused because they see an, an additional value and they just feel that oh maybe I don't know this question well and I have to put residual volume somewhere in the question please understand sometimes there are there is extra information that is going to be given in the question but we don't want to get confused because of that just because we lack the confidence right so please understand when you learn the concepts well your confidence is going to be high and you are not going to be misled with these kind of extra information which are sometimes given in the question Clear everyone? So let's quickly revise this. Expiration capacity is going to be, the, to be the total volume of air a person can expire after a normal expiration also. So it's going to be the sum of total uh, tidal volume and the expiratory reserve volume, which is what is 500 ml plus 1000 ml giving us the value of 1500 ml. And hence the answer, the correct answer for this question is going to be option B. Let's see this question. Select the correct statement for transport of sperm cells in male reproductive system. Okay, pretty simple here. You just have to remember how exactly a sperm travels all across the reproductive system. Okay, you have been given various different options here starting from testes. Second option starts from testes to epididymis. Third option starts for, from uh, seminiferous tubules to reti testes. Yeah, this looks to be appropriate. Then option D is seminiferous tubules, vasa efferentia. No. Okay. So I think I have understood the answer here. But uh, for you all, let me help you with this beautiful set of images where you are going to really understand how exactly a sperm travels and what happens to it in the meanwhile. This is a very important concept and the images that the team has actually produced to portray this question is beautiful. Trust me, it's really going to help you understand how exactly a sperm travels in the male reproductive system. Okay, so first thing is, as you all know, sperm is basically produced in the seminiferous tubules present in the testicles, right? So let me just take the different colored marker here and then I'll help you. Uh, to understand the pathway of the sperm traveling. Okay, so first thing here is that you see seminiferous tubules here. So you see basically seminiferous tubule is nothing but a, uh, you know, network of tubes where uh, the sperm is going to be synthesized. Very important point. Okay, so you see this sperm is there and please keep following the direction of the sperm to understand how exactly it is traveling. So this is seminiferous tubule where the sperm is synthesized let us see from here where does it go so you see that there are these you know fine networks that are coming from the seminiferous tubule and forming a beautiful anastomosing network complex this is what is called as rete testis okay what is it called as rete testis so this sperm is actually going to enter the rete testis after it has been synthesized in the seminiferous tubules clear so seminiferous tubule synthesis is going to happen. From there, it will go to the anastomosing network, tubular network of rete testis. Clear? Now rete testis will further take it to efferent ductules, which are also referred to as, as the uh, vasa efferentia, which actually forms the major head portion of the epididymis. Okay, again, what is epididymis? It's basically a soft and a lightly coiled structure where, where the maturation of sperm is going to happen. 
clear everyone so like that is what i initially also told you that you know we'll see how exactly the sperm moves and what is going to happen to it while it is traveling clear so seminiferous tubules was the synthesis from there it went on to rete testis and from here it will enter the efferent ductules these ones which will lead to formation of the vasa efferentia of course and then formation of the head of the epididy epididymis right so it passes through the rete testis then it reaches the vasa efferentia which i already told you about so here you can see it has reached uh, reached the vasa efferentia from here now it will start traveling through the epididymis and during this process maturation is going to happen so first it will travel through the head part which is also called as the caput epididymis then it will travel to the rest of the body part which is called as corpus epididymis and from here it will travel to tail part which is called as corda epididymis corda word always refers to the tail portion caput word always refers to the head portion okay and you might see these words being used at different places in biology not just in case of you know male uh, reproductive system clear everyone so now when it has traveled to the epididymis what will happen to it it will it has now become mature from here onwards it will be sent or uh, rather it will ascend almost up in the abdomen with the help of a tubule tubu, tube structure or tubular structure again which is called as the vasa deferens or vasa differentia also referred to as the ductus deferens right so you see from here it has gone you know it's kind of shown behind the testicle so that is why you can't see the whole tube so this is where let me just draw it for you what is passing behind here is this structure right so you see the sperm has reached the vasa deferens round now now from the vasa deferens which actually loops over the urinary bladder yeah this vasa deferens is now going to start descending by looping over the urinary bladder and start coming down again into the pelvic cavity so this vasa deferens ascends into the abdomen first and loop over the urinary bladder like i told you already and from here it will enter the ejaculatory duct by fusing with the seminal vesicle right in the meanwhile what is happening the seminal vesicle is also there so it will obviously produce uh, the seminal uh, the volume of the you know spermatic fluid basically and from here it will fuse together and enter into the ejaculatory duct clear it will enter the ejaculatory duct which then enters the urethra and you all know already that for males human males the uh, pathway for urine and semen is the same right they basically have same urinogenital tract okay so then it enters urethra which is a common duct of urine and semen in case of males so this is where it is going to pass through you see this sperm here yeah now i can change back the color so that it highlights it better yeah so this is where the sperm is right now and from here it will obviously have an exit from the external opening which is called as urethral meatus okay this is where the opening is and from here the sperm would take the exit clear now if you try to choose the option you've had a beautiful depiction diagrammatically like i told you you know these images really represented how exactly sperm is moving all across the uh, testicles and then into the you know over the hole of the vasa deferens and then coming to the ejaculatory duct how beautifully it is moving it is very very clear to you in this image so the right answer for this question would be option c that is from seminiferous tubules where it is synthesized to rete testis to vasa efferentia to the whole body of the epididymis starting from head main body and then the tail part of it then going on to the vasa deferens entering the ejaculatory duct along with the seminal vesicle then going to the urethra and then opening outside uh, with the help of urethral meatus okay so the right answer here is option c colostrum the yellowish fluid secreted by mother during the initial days of lactation is very essential to impart immunity to the newborn infants because it contains okay so now i think this is one thing that has you know a lot of social impact also for that matter when you when it comes to basically breastfeeding uh, children okay now what is colostrum which is what is given in this particular question colostrum is basically one of the initial uh, 
volumes of the milk that come out from the mother who is lactating who has just given birth to a child okay so this color this milk is basically much yellowish and much pale in color in comparison to the regular milk that is produced by the mother at the later stages of course but the more important point is that uh, the reason why it is yellowish in color and you know what is the significance of it is that it is very 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 highly rich in nutritional quality yes but more importantly it has huge number of antibodies that are there in case of the uh, mother's first milk huge number of antibodies and especially when you talk about which type of antibody or immunoglobulin you know scientifically we call antibodies as immunoglobulins because they are basically proteinic structure so that makes them globulin part and immuno is why because it is obviously helping with respect to the immune system okay so you've understood why i'm referring to it it to as the immunoglobulin so these immunoglobulin have very very strong capacity to fight against the diseases specifically the type that i was telling you all about is ig a okay which is given in option a that obviously makes this uh option a as the right answer what you need to understand is that this iga or immunoglobulin a is that antibody which can pass through mother's milk to the baby and basically it really helps in building up the immune system against you know all the pathogens that specifically infect the mucous membrane so it really develops the immune system of the mucous membrane okay all the part in the body which basically has mucus, mucus membrane which you know is like you know all the internal lining of most of the organs have mucus membrane so that is why you know this immunoglobulin becomes very important that is exactly what my point of emphasis is here clear everyone so this iga basically develops the immune system of the mucus membrane it helps in neutralization of the toxins it helps in neutralization of the toxins which are secreted specifically by bacteria it even helps in neutralization of the viral particles if at all there is some virus infection okay so because the child will take some time to develop the immune system because you know uh, after it has come out of the womb of the mother it is going to be exposed to all different kind of environment it's going to be exposed to various different kind kind of pathogens infections etc and that is when the child's body is going to synthesize antibodies right but these kind of preformed antibodies with the child which the child is getting from the mother through colostrum and even through later stages uh, of breastfeeding is going to be really helpful for the child to develop the immune system clear yes so quickly revising everything colostrum is the yellowish fluid which is secreted by mother during initial days of lactation lactation is the uh, milk production right okay now uh, this colostrum basically already i told you it has a lot of nutritional factors yes but it also has more importantly immune factors along with other growth factors as such and these immune factors is uh, going to be very highly rich specifically in antibody immunoglobulin a okay this is essential to develop newborn baby to develop the resistance uh, to various antigens and like i told you it basically helps in synthesis of you know a betterment of the immune system or immune response especially at the mucous membrane clear everyone so the right answer for this question is going to be option a that is immunoglobulin a in some plants the female gamete develops into embryo without fertilization and this phenomena is known as okay the options given here are parthenogenesis autogamy parthenocarpy and syngamy okay let me be very clear about this this is one of those questions which even after being very simple uh, is where maximum children made mistake okay and i'll tell you why because they always get confused between these two terms is it parthenogenesis or is it parthenocarpy okay let me clear your doubt for once and for all actually right what is exactly parthenogenesis parthenogenesis is like a generic mechanism where for you know you can talk about plants also you can talk about animals also where the development of organism is going to happen uh, without fertilization okay clear so here you are talking about development of the organism especially from the female without any fertilization event is what is referred to as the parthenogenesis okay uh, genesis is formation here right when you talk about parthenocarpy the word carpy is referring to the carpel which is going to what is going to form the a uh, fruit after fertilization has happened okay but when you talk about parthenocarpy what will happen so carpel i told you is going to lead to formation of fruit 
parthenocarpy when we say we basically refer to the fact that fruit is going to be formed without fertilization clear once again parthenogenesis is basically formation of the organism or the embryo without fertilization and when you talk about parthenocarpy it's specific for plants of course and this is where the fruit is going to be formed without fertilization so if you get a question where it is being asked that you know uh, a fruit is being formed without fertilization so what is the process called as then you will be marking the answer as parth parthenocarpy but here we are talking about plants yes but we are talking about female gamete developing into the embryo so we are talking about formation of the organism without fertilization event so that is why the right answer to this question is going to be option a parthenogenesis and not parthenocarpy clear everyone yes talking about autogamy and syngamy this is something that we know of syngamy is where uh, two gametes are going to fuse to form a diploid zygote i'll take you through, uh, through this particular concept also slightly in detail and autogamy is when uh, the two gametes are going to uh, basically fertilize or fuse uh, which are coming from the same individual all right and we are talking about these examples right now in case of plants only clear so let's start with the explanation part the phenomena of the development of female gamete into embryo without fertilization is called as parthenogenesis and parthenocarpy is basically the formation of seedless fruit without fertilization of course right so examples here you can see seedless variety of watermelon you can see seedless bananas uh, so basically in case of banana it happens quite naturally but yes in case of you know other fruits like you can talk about grapes you can talk about watermelon etc we create the seedless varieties right okay talking about autogamy which was the incorrect option it's fusion of two gametes coming from the same individual right so you see that there's a same flower which is uh, showing to uh, transfer the pollen grains from the anther to the stigma within the same flower so this is what is an example of autogamy talking about syngamy now very beautifully shown this is basically a pollen grain uh, just try to follow the image now it is developing the pollen tube where you can clearly see that the male gametes was formed right so syngamy refers to the fusion of one of the male gametes with egg nucleus to form the diploid zygote so let me take you through this once again very beautiful set of animations very beautiful set of images which is created by the team and it's like you know just for you all so you have to understand how beautifully and so much amount of efforts have gone into this that once you look at these things you would never forget about it in your life right so um, you know it, it happens with me also like if i look at these images these kind of animations things will always by default stay in your head right okay so now here you see the development of pollen tube has happened let me take you to the next set of image here uh, and the animation so this pollen tube which is carrying the male gamete my marker has obviously shifted because it's a moving image it will now enter the female gametophyte from the side of where the egg is lying right where the egg apparatus is there you would remember the structure of the female gametophyte i know this point is not relevant to this question but this image this animation and this whole flow of topic is very important for you from exam point of view from neat exam point of view okay so you have to really understand this topic very well clear okay so let's go ahead now what has happened is that the male uh, gamete has traveled with the help of um, pollen tube towards the egg apparatus where the fertilization event is happening and this will lead to the formation of zygote yes you have understood this topic very well so the right answer to this question which was asking about female gamete developing into the embryo without fertilization the right answer is going to be option a parthenogenesis identify the correct pair representing the causative agent of typhoid fever and the confirmatory test for typhoid okay so first thing is what is typhoid it's basically the enteric fever also we call it as it's basically a bacterial disease which is caused by a bacteria named salmonella typhi there are multiple varieties of it there are there is something called a salmonella para typhi also but here we are looking at salmonella typhi the typhoid which is caused uh, by this particular bacterial agent okay now what happens is that we are looking at the correct pair which is representing the confirmatory test that a person is suffering from typhoid so there is basically a test which is called as vidal test that is used for determination of the typhoid in fact not just the presence of salmonella typhi this test basically determines the level of antibodies that are existing in the body because of which 
the degree of infection can also be found out okay what happens here is that we actually use something called a serial dilution where you use diluted sample of the blood and the serum of course uh, because antibodies are present in the serum here so we are going to use the serum in a diluted fashion to understand up till where are we getting and up till how much dilution also we are getting the presence of these antibodies if the antibodies are present in hugely diluted sample also that means the typhoid is of the greater degree and it has happened you know very recently and the peak is taking place okay clear everyone okay so the next important point here is that what exactly happens in the Vidal test other than this dilution part that you use basically the antigen and the antibody reaction to happen and like I told you we are going to check for the presence of specific antigen and antibodies up till a specific dilution clear okay so right answer is very clear here let us talk about UTI test Vidal test and Anthrone test Vidal test I have already spoken about uh, talking about plasmodium vivax what does it cause it causes malaria so you know that primarily speaking when you look at malaria in an individual you basically look at the blood sample and under the slide and look for the presence of these intracellular parasites on the slide right by staining okay so you don't really use any kind of these titrimetric analysis and all of these kind of complicated tests as such I'm just talking about the preliminary test here though for plasmodium then you talk about uh, streptococcus pneumoniae it is basically the bacteria which is responsible for causing pneumonia so pneumonia has you know various different further testing but more importantly one of the first preliminary things to determine pneumonia uh, is you know of obviously checking the symptomatic things looking at the x-ray if there is fluid build up among in the lungs etc okay then you talk about salmonella typhi i already spoke to you about that talking about uti test uti refers to urinary tract infection so uti testing usually looks for specific type of pathogenic bacteria specific type of yeast etc which might cause urinary tract infection okay and then talking about anthrone test it's basically a cellulose uh, assay kind of thing it's basically an analysis for carbohydrates okay so putting everything together now vidal test bacterial antigen is made to react with the serum of the patient which obviously contains specific antibodies if at all the patient has uh, is suffering from typhoid that means what the bacteria must have entered the system and the body must have you know uh, responded to the antigen by synthesizing antibodies so we are looking at those antibodies is exactly what I told you and explained to you just a while back okay so this happens against the antigen and agglutination in the uh, is going to be observed in the serum agglutination is what it's basically clumping when antigen and antibody come together they show a visible reaction or uh, that you know that you can see actually uh, is what is called as agglutination clumping is what is called as agglutination this confirms the typhoid fever caused by salmonella typhi bacteria going ahead uti test detects and identifies the bacteria and the yeast in the urine sample which may be causing urinary tract infection and one of the most common bacteria to cause uh, UTI is E. coli. So even though E. coli, Escherichia coli is a normal inhabitant of us humans, but there are different varieties of E. coli also which might cause urinary tract infection. Okay, so it might so happen that the doctors are doctor doctors ask the people who suspect a UTI to be to have happened. Uh, they ask the um, you know that particular patient to clean the genital area with an antibiotic swab or something like that so that the external genitalia which we know is not free of microorganism. Uh, the results or the microorganisms present there do not really interfere with the uh, result of the UTI test okay going ahead talking about anthrone test I told you it's a quantification test for carbohydrates it's used commonly for majorly cellulose assay and what is used here is a method of calorimetric determination of carbohydrates where you actually look for the intensity of the color uh, which is going to be proportional to the amount of carbohydrate present in that particular sample okay so the right answer for this question is going to be option a salmonella typhi is going to be determined uh, this test is going to be done with the help of Vidal test okay option a is the correct answer here expressed sequence tags or ESTs refers to what okay so very simple this is basically ESTs is a direct topic from your textbook right so ESTs are basically the genes it refers to the genes uh, which are expressed as the RNA or actually for that matter cDNA also okay now here what you need to really understand is its significance ESTs basically help uh, 
significantly in the human genome project or gene mapping right i'm giving the example of human genome project because that's like one of the biggest projects when it comes to genetics when it comes to mapping of genome so i've given the example of human genome project but of course ests can be used for any other mapping also okay so these are you know specific regions which are lying within the coding region and helps in identification of you know a long set of complete coding genes also so very important point ests right so what are they they are small pieces of dna sequences which are usually barely about like you know 200 to 500 nucleotides long which are expressed as rna in the body or even see dna like i told you you know depending upon what type what type of genome the organism is having now here this point that i said is going to be relevant with respect to virus where we are trying to you know check the sequence of the virus of course it's not an organism but still you know if they have rna as the genome how do you know that what uh, you know what is it sequence and everything so you make a cdna out of it and even for eukaryotic cell when you try to do it you can generate a cdna by uh, from the mrna that the particular individual is expressing and from there also ests can be generated right so these are generated by sequencing either one or both ends of an express genes that's why i said right the mrna final mrna after the post translational modification has happened you can use that okay clear everyone so the right answer for this question is gene expressed as rna match the column type of question right so we have been given two columns column one column two in column one we can see there are few hormones and important components that are listed and in column two you see there are certain conditions and diseases that are uh, listed we have to create a match which disease is associated with which hormone or component clear yes so like i always solve the match the following type of question we won't try to make an attempt here we'll first try to revise all the concepts that are associated with the given uh, options here so first thing we'll go on to the diabetes mellitus okay what is diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus is basically a sugar a sugar related disorder it's basically when the body either doesn't produce insulin enough in the enough quantity or it is not using the insulin which is produced in an effective manner both of these problems basically result in high blood sugar right causing blood sugar levels to be abnormally high and what does this high blood sugar uh, is going to cause it's going to cause frequent urination frequent thirst yeah uh, slow wound healing weakness yes you know that insulin is so essential for glucose utilization the uptake of maximum uh, you know amount of glucose within the cells usually happens with the help of insulin so if insulin is deficient then you understand how glucose metabolism is going to get affected right and that is why these individuals show a very high amount of blood sugar uh, especially when it is not treated well especially when it is not controlled well clear next we go on to goiter what is goiter is basically the enlarged thyroid gland like you see here this thyroid gland is shown in an enlarged way so this is actually sometimes visible even outside you know people have their literally the whole neck as uh, you know it appears to be swollen so this results in the swelling of neck due to and this happens due to iodine deficiency in 90% of the cases but sometimes it also happens due to overproduction of thyroxine etc you know what is associated with the thyroid gland so very important point here is that there is going to be enlargement of the thyroid gland yes goiter usually happens in you know more than 90% of the cases due to iodine deficiency but it can also happens due happen due to uh, you know when the thyroid gland really swells up badly by producing um, too much amount of thyroxine also okay yes that is clear to you then we go on to addison's disease what is addison's disease it basically results due to inadequate uh, production of the steroid hormone especially cortisol and aldosterone which are secreted by the adrenal adrenal glands now ad add renal glands right so basically they are associated with the renal with the tube uh, with the with the kidneys right so if you see uh, on literally the head of the kidneys you would see adrenal gland located like this okay yeah yeah cap like structure so we call them as add renal gland so these glands basically secrete out hormones like you know steroid hormones like cortisol aldosterone etc and when these hormones are lacking what happens is that it leads to the renal insufficiencies because of which because of which symptoms like you know fatigue uh, weakness uh, low blood uh, sugar there is skin darkening etc that is going to be seen and one of the most characteristic point here is that the presence of 
you know low blood sugar in fact because of this the person is always feeling tired especially when they are standing for longer duration you know they feel weak all the time there is a sense of fatigue etc that is happening okay so addison's disease is this then you talk about acromegaly acromegaly refers to you know this kind of improportionate a uh, kind of enlargement of face you talk about hands you talk about feet etc and this happens usually due to excess of growth hormone that is produced fine so enlargement of hands and feet and even face disproportionately for that matter which is what is caused by excess growth hormone okay there was there was another option which is uh, diabetes insipidus given in the question insipidus basically refers to tasteless okay what is it it's basically tasteless so here what happens is that this is diabetes but it is not associated with insulin as such what it is associated with is the lack of adh what is adh it is anti diuretic hormone clear now what happens is that because there is a lack of anti diuretic hormone the amount of urine that is synthesized by the body is kind of very very high but it's very very dilute urine okay it's very high amount of dilute urine uh, which is going to be produced so let me write it down here here okay and uh, because there is too much of dilution there is barely presence of you know components like glucose etc there which should not be present even in normal cases yes but the uh, but here the urine is really dilute compared to a normal person also so uh, that is why the the word tasteless is coming here right clear everyone so now let us try to create a match here okay so insulin we go on to diabetes mellitus this is a then we go on to thyroxin which is going to be obviously associated with goiter then we go on to acromegaly which is you know growth hormone so i'm going to write down d here then you have corticoids which is obviously associated with uh, addison's disease so we have um, basically a5 b4 d uh, c1 and then d3 which is option d for us i hope with that you have understood this question very well here is a very interesting and a very important question which is based on the counter current mechanism happening in the kidneys for the concentration of urine okay which of the following factors is responsible for the formation of concentrated urine very 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 important concept very important question for that matter all right so the first statement says hydrostatic pressure during glomerular filtration so we know basically uh, at the level of baumann's capsule the hydrostatic pressure is built up due to the difference in the diameters of the afferent and the efferent arterioles so because of this there is a hydrostatic pressure built up which is which is why the filtrate is going to pass through and enter into the tubular network okay so this is not what is responsible for concentration of urine as such so this statement is rejected here look at the option 2 low levels of anti diuretic hormone or adh no this is not uh, what is going to concentrate the urine it's actually going to dilute the urine if you have higher concentration of adh that is what is going to concentrate the urine it's anti diuretic right it's going to work in an antagonistic way of diuresis you know you have to understand that diuresis is basically a lot of amount of urine output okay so coming to option c maintaining hyper osmolarity towards the medullary interstitium in the kidneys yes this is exactly the right answer and i'll show you this thing once again with a beautiful set of images with a beautiful set of transfer of molecules which are happening between the henle's loop and vasa recta okay going to option d secretion of erythropoietin by jga juxtaglomerular apparatus or juxtaglomerular complex no it's not erythropoietin that is secreted by it it's actually the renin right okay and that too it has contribution towards regulating the blood pressure but as of now for the concentration of urine the option which works the best is going to be option c okay so let us understand this whole process that is happening concentration of urine for this purpose we have a very special arrangement of loop of henle and vasa recta what is vasa recta it is basically that point where uh, it's the net network of basically the blood vessels which is kind of wrapped around the henle's loop or loop of henle and this is what is happening in the medullary area and this whole loop of henle and the network of vasa recta this special arrangement of it happens or forms for the purpose of concentration of urine 
okay for the purpose of concentration of urine and while it is doing so a beautiful osmotic concentration of the medullary interstitium is going to be maintained why i am using the word beautiful you must be think you might be thinking here because we have such intricate and such uh, you know, let me just use the word beautiful again, beautiful mechanism of how exactly our body controls all these bodily function at like, you know, literally, you know, smaller than the nano levels also. It's just uh, amazing. It really amazes me. And so is one of these mechanisms, which is called as countercurrent mechanism. Okay, so let me start with this. The special arrangement of Henley's loop and Vasa recta is what is going to contribute to the countercurrent mechanism. Helps to maintain a concentration gradient in the medullary interstitial which in turn helps in concentrating urine by easy passage of water from the collecting uh, tubule. So you have to understand this point here that if you try to recall this loop of Henle is kind of de deep embedded uh, in the medullary area of the kidneys. Okay, so I'm hoping that part is very clear to you all. So I'll just start with the uh, flow of the fluids happening here. Let me just change the marker color yeah okay so right now i want you all to first thing understand that this concentrations that are seen here uh seen here are the concentration given as osmolarity happening or existing in the medullary interstitium okay so this is given in osmoles as such all right this yellowish color tube that you are seeing is the loop of henley loop of henley this reddish color tube or pale pinkish color tube, you know, let me call it that way. I was saying red because of the presence of blood, of course. But yes, here, this is Vasa recta. Okay. Another thing that you have to be very cautious about here in this particular concept is that what is the direction of movement of fluid? And, you know, we call them as ascending limb and the descending limbs. So for loop of Henle, this is the descending limb of loop of Henle. Yeah. And this is the ascending limb i'm just writing it out very very close to the tube as such okay then uh, i'm talking about uh, the vasa recta first so this is the descending limb of the vasa recta and this is the ascending limb of the vasa recta okay now just follow my uh, speech just understand what i'm trying to say here okay so first thing is we all know the ascending limb of the loop of henley is impermeable to water right but it is highly permeable to salts to sodium to potassium to chloride specifically sodium chloride okay let's let's just you know talk about salts right now so this ascending limb of, limb of loop of henley is highly permeable to salts and this salt is going to be removed out in the interstitial area medullary interstitial area okay when it is done so, obviously due to this whole thing is happening by active transport. We know salts are basically they form the charged ions and charged molecules cannot just travel across the membrane. They need active transport to do that, right? So when this is happening, what is going to happen is the descending limb of Vasa recta takes up this sodium chloride or the salts from the interstitial area into the Vasa recta network. Okay, so descending limb after taking it will move towards the ascending limb. So the blood which has taken up all the sodium chloride and you know the maximum amount of uh, salt etc from here and a lot of um, you know further salts also they are going to move up into the ascending limb of the vasa recta. Okay, when this is happening, we know that this vasa recta, this ascending limb of vasa recta is present around the descending limb of loop of Henle. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. So what will happen is that due to this difference in the concentration and due to the permeability of the descending limb of loop of Henle, descending limb of loop of Henle, this is highly permeable to water. Yeah, and barely permeable to salts, permeable to water. Okay, so what will happen here? Here what will happen is that as this fluid is moving upward, which is highly concentrated in salts right now, because you know from here, from here it has taken up a lot of salt and it is moving ahead to the ascending limb of the Vasa recta. What will happen? It's highly concentrated, but as it is going up, it will start taking up the water that is being released out from the descending limb of loop of Henley and simultaneously it is going to be taken up by the ascending limb of Vasa recta. 
okay when this happens of course this is not going to happen directly from tube to tube it is going to happen with the help of interstitially uh, medullary interstitium the space that is there in the medulla there everything is going to be transported at for, transported first and from there it will be taken up either by vasa recta or loop of henle whatever we are referring to at that particular point of time yeah so what will happen here the vasa recta will leave with almost you know as much concentration as it came with just by uh, kind of taking up whatever essential things were there in the loop of henle it's kind of derived it out of the loop of henle clear everyone this point is very clear now what will happen further is that this vasa recta which was taking up you know whatever it could collect from the loop of henle from here it had taken all the salts as such and from here it has taken all the water as such and ultimately it is going to move to the vein okay and obviously leaves the kidney premises if required right clear everyone yes you are very clear with this point so this is a very 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 important concept like i always say to children so this is your baumann's capsule this is where the you know with the help of hydrostatic pressure it's going to filter out whatever uh, can be filtered out that at that point of time into the pct you have this dct here and between this is your loop of henle like you already see here so here is where the counter current mechanism is working especially in the medullary area with the help of this vasa recta yeah why is this counter current mechanism because if you try to now have a look at it as an overall picture you would see that in one limb the fluid is going downward but the limb which is surrounding it the fluid is moving upward then the when the limb is going upward this i'm referring to as the loop of henle the blood vessels around it is taking the fluid downward so this kind of you know opposite direction movement is allowing the absorption and movement of components very very uh, appropriate very fast very effective yes clear everyone okay so now we go on to the you know incorrect options as well talking about glomerular filtration it's basically a passive process that initiates the urine formation and it uses hydrostatic pressure outward pressure due to the fluids right to force the fluids solute and solutes through the membrane so this is what you are seeing as the uh, you know baumann's capsule is there which is obviously putting up some kind of negative pressure to the fluid that is trying to enter the proximal convoluted tubule okay going ahead you have adh concept i already told you it is the high level of adh which will lead to formation of concentrated urine and not low level low level will actually cause uh, the diluted urine to be formed okay where is adh released from it's released from the hypothalamus okay going to uh, jga or juxta glomerular apparatus it is basically that sensitive region which is formed by special cellular modification of the uh, uh, happening at the dct level and the affer uh, afferent arteriole uh, here at the dct level around the dct what cells are modified into are called as macula densa cells and near the afferent arteriole cells are the jga cells which secrete out renin and not erythropoietin like it was given in the question okay this renin is responsible for regulation of the blood pressure so the right answer ultimately for this question is option c select the hormone releasing intrauterine device okay so we are looking at hormone releasing intrauterine device which is also called as iud okay so what is exactly an iud iud is basically a device okay which is inserted into the uterus towards the fallopian tube of course uh, but this happens through the opening of the vagina okay now here the most important point is that you have to look at this particular point that we are looking at iud's which are hormone releasing and are not you know like you have learned about copper releasing or barium sulfate releasing etc okay so you have to be very cautious about what the question is asking it's a straight question it's a direct question and it can easily fetch you marks okay let us look at the options here we have lippies loop we have multi load 375 both of them are iud's okay we have walls we have lng20 walls are basically barrier contra contraceptives lng20 yes it is a hormone releasing iud talking about multi load 375 and progesta cert this both are basically iud's only but only this one is hormone releasing 
okay let me just point out at things which are hormone releasing i'm writing it down hr to represent hormone releasing uh, this is hormone releasing yes this is also hormone releasing and hence the right answer to this question is obviously option d i'll tell you why lipase loop multi load 375 uh, are not considered here as the correct answer because yes they are iod's but they release either copper or you know barium sulfate for that matter and not and are not hormone releasing type of iod's clear everyone that is why i told you it's a straight forward question you can easily uh, get marks but at the same time uh, just by lack of concentration you can lose marks because children happen to see only iod's and not the hormone releasing part of it okay so let's quickly revise the concept here iod's are the birth control devices that are ins inserted into the uterus by vagina to prevent pregnancy they are of two types usually they can be uh, you know copper releasing as such or they can be hormonal releasing uh, copper releasing is what we have listed down here but you as i told you sometimes it might be made up of copper or and uh, it might have some other chemical components like barium sulfate etc okay so these ones are made up of plastic and copper this one is made up of majorly plastic and contains levonorgestrel which is basically a synthetic form of progesterone which obviously is slowly released into the uterus and hence preventing the implantation etc hence acting like a contraceptive device all right so copper um, iud's example is multi load 375 copper t uh, and when you talk about hormonal one you have progestacert you have lng20 and i already told you about lipase loop which is also an iud but it is it has basically barium sulfate okay so the right answer for this question is going to be option d so this is again a match the following type of question we have two columns in column 1 we have examples of certain organisms and in column 2 we have specific parts associated with those organisms okay so without uh, or rather than trying to attempt the question here let's try to understand each and every option okay first was pila pila is also called as apple snail it's basically a mollusk you know what are mollusks they belong to phylum mollusca okay so this uh, particular pila they have these special feeding organs which are called as radula okay what are they they are called as radula you can see it in the image the moving image that you see like you know just above me it's beautifully showing how exactly it is uh, working right so basically uh, there are these um, you know very very fine plate like and uh, fine teeth like kind of structure very very minute teeth like structure which basically helps in scraping and eating the food so this is very important for pila okay so it, we call it as file like rasping organ called radula which is going to help the pila in feeding okay next we go on to bombyx which is basically silkworm bombyx mori think of bombyx mori yes it's basically the silkworm what does it do with respect to its excretion that it has this special part called as malpighian tubules uh, it's a worm it's basically um, referring to the phylum arthropoda okay so it belongs to phylum arthropoda it has for excretion these special tubules called as malpighian tubules what happens here is that all these components like salt uric acid water they all enter from the hemolymph into the tubules okay it enters into the malpighian tubules and from there the reabsorption of all the important components like you know salt and water etc is going to happen and this is going to get recycled but the uric acid and the remaining waste etc is going to be thrown out as feces right so excretion of uric acid and feces is going to happen okay then we go on to pleurobrachia what is pleurobrachia it's basically a, a member of phylum tenophora it's a tenophore and the most important point about the members of tenophora that you've learned about yes of course they are marine animals but the most important point here is that they have these special uh, ciliary comb plates okay they have these beautiful comb plates over the body like you see here in this uh, and here also um on their body which basically ciliated and this because of being ciliated helps in the swimming and the locomotion okay so it has ciliated structures which are called as comb plates which helps in locomotion and swimming of course they are marine right then you go on to tenia 
Tinea basically refers to tapeworm. Of course, they belong to phylum platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes. Helminth means worm. Platy is referring to the flatworms, right? So the point here is that for their excretion purpose, they have specialized cells called as flame cells. So it has specialized cell called as flame cell, which helps in osmoregulation, that is salt and water balance of the body, and for excretion. Clear? Now when we try to create a match, okay. Pila has radula. So let me write down A here. Then uh, we go on to Bombyx. It has Bombyx was the Bombyx mori was the silkworm. So it basically has the malpigian tubules. Then we go on to Pleurobrachia, which is a tenophore. It has um, the comb plates. And then we go on to Tinea, uh, Tinea solium, etc., which is basically flatworm, which has flame cells. Okay. So the right answer here is going to be option C. That is A3, B4, C2 and D1. You know, matches doesn't matter really here. Uh, it can, for different questions, it can change, of course, in different exams. But what is important here, here is to understand which particular organ belongs to which particular organism. So the right answer here is going to stay as C. Which of the following sexually transmitted diseases is not completely curable. So as you see, we have option, uh, you know, options listed here and all four of them are sexually transmitted uh, diseases or sexually tra uh, transmitted uh, infections. We are looking at the one which is not completely curable. Okay, so here you need to understand that three of them, chlamydiasis, gonorrhea and syphilis are bacterial, whereas this one, genital herpes is basically viral. You know, just like how hepatitis is there, how HIV is there, just like that genital herpes is viral in nature. Because the other three are bacterial, it is possible for us to literally cure them, uh, you know, depending upon the degree of infection, yes, it is possible for us to cure them with the help of antibiotics because you know antibiotics are active against bacteria. But for genital herpes, yes, medicinally speaking you can give the person symptomatic relief as such but are you going to cure the person of this no it's not possible because it's like a latent virus that means what it lives inside the body after some time and it is there right and on certain triggers etc this is going to be reactivated and kind of forms the source etc that it causes you know herpetic source uh, it causes that again in the body so you can treat the symptoms but you cannot cure it completely Clear? Yes. So the answer here is going to be uh, option D. Okay. So let us talk about uh, all these three first. Syphilis, gonorrhea and chlamydiasis. Chlamydiasis is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. This is a bacterial disease which basically causes um, infection of cervix etc. in case of women uh, and obviously you know in case of males also it causes uh, urinary tract infection or genital infection I should say rather. Okay. Talking about gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is uh, caused by a bacteria named as Neisseria gonorrhea. This is also a sexually transmitted disease. It basically invades the mucous membrane etc of the uh, you know reproductive tract and the urinogenital tract and makes lesions as such. Talking about syphilis, syphilis is caused by a spirochete. It's a very, you know, fast swimming kind of bacteria. Uh, we call it as uh, trep treponema pallidum. Okay, this is also a bacterial disease. This also invades basically the squamous epithelium, the columnar epithelium, etc. and causes the infection. But like I said, all three of them are bacterial and depending upon the degree of infection, we can definitely cure them by specific antibiotic treatment. Clear? Yes. But when we go on to genital herpes, it, which is caused by, you know, HSV or herpes simplex virus, this basically causes sores and blisters, which are very, very painful when they are active. Uh, they release out fluid, etc. And this is highly infective. Okay. After some time when it dries, when the blisters dry, when the, uh, when the painful, you know, bumps, etc. They dry, they form scabs and they might stay there for a while and it can literally recur for years. Okay, and after some time the infection can come back again. Okay, and that is why I said genital herpes is not going to be treatable. And for that reason, the right answer to this question is option D, genital herpes. Drug called heroin is synthesized by, first thing, what is heroin? Heroin is a highly addictive, very dangerous opioid drug. Okay, it's an opioid drug. And, and this is actually obtained from a drug 
which is called as morphine, which is sometimes medically used to treat extreme amount of pain. But yes, it's a prescribed drug, cannot be taken by anyone randomly. And very important point here is that this is this heroin is a very, very, very dangerous and very uh, kind of addictive kind of drug. Okay, so this heroin, how is it obtained? It's basically like a crude form of, you know, dimorphine or uh, properly chemically speaking, it's diacetyl morphine. So it's formed by acetylation of morphine. Okay, clear everyone. How is morphine obtained? Morphine is obtained by a plant called as, uh, you know, poppy plant. Okay, we call it as scientifically speaking, papaverse omniferum. So here what you are seeing is uh, an image of poppy plant. From poppy plant, from the latex of it, in fact, you obtain the morphine. Okay, and by acetylation of this morphine are you going to get diacetyl morphine which is also called as dimorphine like I said and this is what is called as the heroin. Clear everyone? So the right answer for this question is going to be option C acetylation of morphine. What is the site of perception of photoperiod necessary for induction of flowering in plants. So first thing is you know what is this concept of photo period, right? Photo period is basically that period of light which is going to affect the reproductive cycle of the plant and the response of the plant towards it, of course, right? You know, I'm just saying it in a very crude and a short form. It's basically the physiological response that the plant has towards the photo period, towards the duration of light and dark for some plants, of course, uh, to which it is exposed. And this basically affects the reproductive cycle of the plant. And hence, it basically, uh, when we say reproductive, it means what, which part of the plant is it going to affect? You know, it's going to really affect the flowers. The flowering phenomena is what we are going to talk about. But here the question is about the site of perception. It means which part of the plant is going to perceive this kind of stimulus. It's going to receive this kind of stimulus. So as you know, the part of the plant which receives light etc is going to be the leaves, right? So the right answer here is obviously going to be option A, leaves. Talking about lateral buds, pulvinus, which is like the leaf base, shoot apex, no. Yes, uh, shoot apex is going to be involved later on during photoperiodism uh, or photoperiodic responses, but the stimulus is going to be received majorly by the leaves. Clear everyone? So let us look at a diagrammatic flow of this. The site of perception of photoperiodism lies in the leaves as such. What happens here is that this photoperiodism is going to affect something called as critical day length, right? Cl critical photoperiod. What is critical photoperiod? It is basically that photoperiod, that, uh, you know, exposure or duration of the day length, either above which or below which, if the plant is not given the right amount of light or dark exposure, the plant is not going to flower, okay? And based on this, we classify the plants as, you know, short day plants or long day plants or long night plants, you know, like short day plants would can also be called as long night plants for that matter. And the third category is the day neutral plants, okay? We have taken an example of short day plants here. Just to understand this, what happens here is, I'm just trying to convey the concept of critical photo period here. So if this line kind of depicts the critical photo period, um, above which is like, you know, uh, we are talking about light and below the darker color, this gray area is, let's say, representing the darker area. So if it is a short day plant, it's critical photo period, uh, how does it really work? So this short day plant should have light exposure lesser than the critical photo period. You see, this light exposure is lesser than the critical photo period and only in that condition, the plant is going to flower like you see here. If you look at the first column or rather the first image, here what has happened is that the, uh, the critical photo period the light exposure has happened more than the critical photo period. This has led to non-flowering of the plant. Also in third case, you see that the light exposure is lesser than the critical photo period, but the plant has still not flowered uh, or it has still not, uh, you know, induction of flowering has not happened. Why? Because the dark period, if you see, is interrupted by light here. So for short day plants, it's very essential for the night to be completely uninterrupted. Okay, it has to have continuous dark period for induction of flowering. Why does this happen? Because, you know, for whatever uh, duration of light, these specific plants need specific exposure. This leads to release of something called as florigen. 
from the leaves of course and this moves on to the uh, shoot apical meristem you know that is what i was telling you shoot apex is involved but it is not directly involved right now okay and this whole process is going to affect the flowering process okay so the right answer for this question is going to be option a leaves so children that was all about the discussion of today's session today's set of neat questions from 2019 biology section i hope you all followed all the concepts very very well we'll meet up next time very soon till then keep learning